Hello, hello. So it's me, Valeria Corvo from Traveling Cuervo. If you guys follow me and you've watched me before and you're probably like, she hasn't posted in a minute. She doesn't really have a schedule. Yes, that is true. So I thought I would try a new media, podcasting, so I could make content a little bit more frequently. So yeah, this is my introduction. For the next couple of posts, I'm gonna be trying podcasting. You guys can follow me on Spotify, on Apple Podcast, or watch it through YouTube. So on with the video. It's very, very exciting. Aww. Today, I'm gonna be going over an odd topic. Former President Donald Trump passed an executive order to make federal buildings beautiful again. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but for the time being, I'm assuming it means to make all executive buildings look old and imposing, like the White House, the Capitol, the Lincoln Memorial. Now, all these buildings were designed off a neoclassical style, large columns, marble, you get it, the whole nine. But this is where our story begins. This is going to be a very interesting story about the West obsession with Greece. Not Greece the country, but ancient Greece, not just a place, a time. A time that if anything would be as much as a help as a hindrance to the modern state of Greece. So the West likes to start its history in antiquity. Ancient Greece, not the first, but the first notable European empire. A time when people ate grapes, debated and walked around in robes. In a way, the first big academic enlightenment. Academia and knowledge would forever be tied to ancient Greece. And the West would see itself as the inheritors of these Hellenistic traditions. This sort of knowledge. This knowledge that would be taught in school. Education for many, many years was on one hand the Bible, and then on the other you'd find work of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. There would be multiple rebirths of periods of study for Greece, from the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, to the Enlightenment. Basically, those in pursuit of knowledge would automatically become obsessed with the classics from ancient Greece. Because, I mean, the only other option was the Bible. <laughs> This is why, when the Greeks declare revolution in 1821, it becomes a world phenomenon. Scholars, elites, poets, most notably Lord Byron, they all ran into support of the Greeks. Remember that other revolutions were going around in the 1820s, but it was just the Greek one that gained a lot of recognition. There were supporters in France, England, the US, Russia. Men from all these Western countries were pledging their lives to go fight in a revolution of a country they had never even visited, not simply because it was a revolution of the state, but because they saw it as the rebirth of antiquity. This was the rebirth of everything they had ever learned about. Thing is, when these soldiers arrived, they realized that they weren't exactly fighting for the liberation of ancient Greece, because ancient Greece no longer existed. They were fighting for the modern day Greece, and so these soldiers would note how different it was from what they imagined. They weren't debating Socrates, but they were fighting in the trenches with everyday soldiers. This wasn't what they imagined true Greece was like. The Westerners would presume that they would know more about true Greekness than, well, actual Greeks, and this sort of idea didn't go away with time. At the end of the Greek War of Independence, the revolutionaries had to figure out where to put the capital. And well, Athens, although it's the capital now, it didn't really make a lot of sense at the time. Because it wasn't a city at all. It was a village. A provincial village. It looked nothing like a capital. Many Greeks thought that the capital should be Nathlio, a bustling port town with a lot of traffic. But because of Western infatuation with ancient Greece and because of the power that they had lended during the revolution, pressure was put on the Greeks to move the capital from this bustling port town to Athens, which, remember, wasn't much of anything at the time. The modern day city of Athens was built largely from scratch and very, very quickly. The city of Athens was built in a neoclassical style, so largely based off of ancient Greece. But the city was designed by urban planners that weren't at all Greek. 
These Western architects thought that they knew more about what it was like to be Greek than actual Greeks because they had somehow studied the classics, and they had an idea of what Greek was, however based solely off ancient Greece. Modern Greek buildings were designed to look old. They were meant to give the visual statement that this is Greece, even though it was supposed to be ancient Greece. So it's peculiar because the capital was built to look old, to take you back into a reimagined time. Even today, when you look at travel posters or pamphlets for Greece, you see something like, travel back in time and visit Greece. As if when you're getting on an airplane, you aren't only traveling through space, but through time. And this is all because Western powers had a specific idea of what they wanted Greece to look like. And so we might think that it's weird that the capital of Greece was built to look like this supposed ancient version of itself, but it's not. Actually, the same thing happened in the US. When the US capital was built, its architects looked towards ancient Greece for inspiration as well. Humans are wired to look at the old and be enamored by it. We're taught that that which is old and ancient commands some sort of respect whether that be vintage jeans or ancient temples. So when the founding fathers were building the capital, they wanted the capital to command the same sort of respect. They wanted it to look old. And what can be more old than the first European empires that they learned about? It also didn't hurt that the structural foundation of this country was largely built off of ancient Greece. I mean, American revolutionaries were inspired by Athenian democracy. The 13 colonies turned into the 13 states. There's a belief in natural law and a heavy reliance on constitution. So naturally, if the foundation of the country has such a heavy basis in ancient Greece, they're gonna wanna pay some sort of homage to it. The capital is therefore designed in this neoclassical style. So imagine this, we have two capitals very far away from one another, built in a similar sort of style. One a replica, one an homage both tracing back its history to this reimagined time. Ancient Greece existed, but it's definitely been a couple of millennia since then. This past has created complex relationships in the present. In the US, what does it mean that the structural foundations of this country are based off of a history that's not really theirs at all? Why are we focusing so much on the Greek history instead of focusing on the native one, even for our architecture? What does it mean that the symbols of democracy must not only look towards Greece, but look like Greece? And in Greece, what does this mean for the modern day? There's a forever tension between ancient Greece and modern Greece. They coexist in a space. All because Western powers have this certain notion of what they want Greece to look like. And it wouldn't matter, except that there's a heavy reliance that Greece has on these other Western powers. One that trickles down to today. From revolution to debt cycles. What does it mean for the modern state of Greece? This balance between independence and dependence. So this is the end of the episode. This is my second podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys like traveling to the past with me, your host, Valeria Corbo. Uh, if you like this episode, give it a thumbs up. I would say subscribe, but I'm not entirely sure what you do in this case. But yeah, this is just some cool facts that I learned in NYU and I thought I would share. So yeah, hope you guys liked it. If you do, let me know. Bye.